no more desperate moment exists than the final round of a close championship fight. Gone are all the pretense of feeling out process, the time to talk or think. Gone are the life-altering effort already done in camp. It's just three scant minutes between a man and his destiny. Three minutes, and another man, just as desperate, tough, and talented. They met at a crossroads in their careers, each trying to solidify their status as a champion whose name would live through history. as the successor to the greatest of all time, as his time came to a close. Fighters are better, and I am the greatest fighter, and I always remember this, all of you out there, I am the greatest fighter of all time. The division Ali largely dominated was now wide open. That dominated division contained a couple of notable exceptions. The most relevant was Ken Norton. Norton was a standout athlete in school in multiple sports. He went to college on a football scholarship. After he graduates, he enlists in the Marines, took up boxing in the military, and quickly gained a reputation as the best to come from the Marine Corps since Gene Tunney. Norton goes 29 and one. Ranked within the top 10, and takes on the number two ranked Muhammad Ali. Ali jabbed with his hand by his hips. When his jab returned, it returned to his hip. With the help of the genius trainer, Eddie Futch, Ken worked out that he didn't need to match speed with Ali because nobody could. He just jabbed as Ali jabbed. With proper timing and Ali's low hands, he had no reliable answer or defense for it. The other man and Ali last night at a party, actually. You got to stand up, fight it, and I don't think it's really fun. The right got into Ali and then a left. Ken had a far larger arsenal in his deep bag of tricks. Norton's unusual cross-guard defense prioritized shutting down the jab first by catching and redirecting it with the palm of his hand. And then sprung into action and quickly ended the process. Or not Ken had a deeply layered defense beyond that. And then finally, live, we are coming up to the two-minute mark. That's for the third round, but some dancing and some moves. His offense was as awkward as it was effective. Their first clash in March of 1973 is the only definitive encounter between them, in the sense that it was the only fight of their trilogy with a clear winner. Muhammad Ali, supposedly as early as the second round, was fighting with a broken jaw. Oh, 
And as a 5 to 1 underdog, Ken Norton upset the greatest heavyweights of all time. A happy Kenny Norton and an unbelievable fight here today. Muhammad Ali would have talked to you, I'm sure. He couldn't because of the broken jaw. Ward off Norton. While Ali and Ken would clash twice more. Yes, he hurt Nardez again. He's hurt Norton. In both. A digging left hand. Of the it was two fights virtually too close to call. He might. 40 seconds left. The crowd is going absolutely berserk. Ali having a scoring round. And now Norton scoring. And two fights that pushed Ali to the limit of his technical ability. Ken may have come up short on the cards, but Muhammad knew in his heart he never did beat Ken Norton clearly. Still the heavyweight champion. You really sound, you don't sound very happy about it. You, you kind of sound like the loser. Yeah, I lost. I got beat. While training for that first fight with Ken, Ali constructed a training camp in the middle of the woods in Pennsylvania. Ali was in search of sparring partners to live and train with him at his Deer Lake training camp. He had Angelo Dundee search the teeming gyms of Pennsylvania. But finding someone to emulate Ken Norton's genius jab and cross guard style was easier said than done. One of the men Angelo brought in was Larry Holmes. Larry was from just up the road in Easton, Pennsylvania. Larry had to drop out of school to help support his 12 siblings. He was 18 when he found boxing and found it a far better career path than making a dollar an hour at a car wash. Within a few short years, Larry found himself with a growing reputation for his outstanding jab and gliding footwork. When Angelo invited him to train at Deer Lake, Larry jumped at the opportunity to learn at Ali's side and give the champ some sparring. After the Ali versus Norton fight, Larry left Ali's camp armed with the knowledge and experience earned across a ring. Sparring in many high-profile camps, including five years across the ring from Joe Frazier. Holmes picked up some of Ali's useful habits. In a rare few moments, Larry could even float and sting like the man himself. He went on a long winning streak, building his record and comfort under the bright lights. Even if the competition he faced in the ring was rarely as tough as it was in the gym. And the referee is going to stop it. To prove he belonged in with the big boys, Larry took the most dangerous fight he could. Ernie Shavers was, according to everyone he ever hit, the hardest hitter of all time. The early rounds of any fight with a puncher like Ernie Shavers is like tiptoeing through a minefield. Larry fought to earn Ernie's respect and soon found out Shaver's reputation was far more than just talk. Larry took some hellacious shots.
By round five, it was Ernie stuck in the corner eating bombs. It was a coming-of-age fight for Larry. It was proof he learned more than the sweet side of the sweet science. He went to war with the hardest puncher of any generation. As praiseworthy as his jab and footwork always were, Larry proved in the Shavers fight he possessed a champion's grit. When Ali lost to Leon Spinks, Spinks was ordered by the WBC to face their number one contender, who was at the time Ken Norton. But like every boxer who came after him, Leon Spinks had a deep and abiding respect for Muhammad Ali. Leon opted to drop the WBC belt and give Ali a rematch. Ten Ali, one Eva, four Spinks, the new champion, Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali. The WBC named Ken Norton its champion and ordered him to fight Larry Holmes. They met at Caesars Palace and a fight broadcast for free on ABC. It began as a chess match. It's arguably the greatest jabbing contest to ever happen at heavyweight. Larry's jab was a workhorse of a punch. It was fast, accurate, and was deceptively damaging. Ken bothered Holmes with the same catch and pitch tactics that Ali hated. That cross guard and open palm meant even landing a jab on Ken was a risk. Larry went headhunting. Ken was trying to kill the body up close while landing counters upstairs. It was two of the most skilled heavyweights locked in a lethal struggle. It was fought at a pace rarely matched since. A vicious war of attrition. Fatigue ground those skills down as the rounds passed. Ken Norton cut the ring, and Larry fought him off. By the championship rounds, both men are consumed with exhaustion 
in a dead even fight. Round 15 for the fighters was a trip through hell. The crisp jab and high skill of the early rounds have long given way to a desperate, violent slugfest. It was war in the deepest sense. All those fine skills win rounds, but it's grit and conditioning that wins and keeps a championship. In a 15th round in hell, being stubborn and in tip-top condition matters more than any remaining grace or fluidity. Ken and Larry both deeply believed they were the champion the man deserving to take the torch as the greatest began to fall into his cruel, tragic, and untimely final silence. It's been decades and dozens of viewings, and I still don't know who won this fight. Larry technically won a decision with all three judges, having him up by just one round. It was that final infernal round that won Larry his championship. But with such a display of grit and bravery from both men, all I know is I'll end up watching it again and end up in awe at the skills and stubbornness of those two champions, digging deep to prove themselves a worthy successor to the greatest of all time.